Welcome back to Lesson 9 of our study of the book of Isaiah for the fall semester of 2024. Last week we began looking at the indictment upon Israel, why they were judged for their sin, uh, and sins that God lists here. I got through number 5 last week, uh, given number 6 this week, but uh, God's judgment is just. Uh, God doesn't judge just because he can. He judges because of people's sin. And this week we'll look at the sixth indictment upon Israel, and that is the, the godless women. Uh, if you read Isaiah 3, 16 through 26, kind of a difficult passage of scripture uh, because the wording is archaic. Uh, it's outdated. And very foreign to English-speaking people today. Uh, and so I've tried to go through and to update the language here uh, as to the uh, things that God uses as an indictment against the godless women. Uh, now, many of these things are not sin within themselves. I mean, if you look down to the list... Um, Ornaments about their feet, uh, uh, anklets, anklet bracelets, uh, people wear them today. Uh, necklaces, bracelets, people wear them today. Veils, uh, nothing wrong with that. Headbands, nothing wrong with that. Uh, nose jewels and earrings, uh, scripturally there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, whether you like it or don't like nose rings, uh, has nothing to do with it. But scripturally there's nothing wrong with that. Um, Party clothes, I mean, as far as uh, what that means, as long as it's modest, again, nothing wrong. Ornate combs and carry purses. And none of these things it, that I've mentioned here are wrong in themselves. Now, number one, uh, haughty with their noses in the air, uh, prideful is what it is, and wanton eyes, uh, seducing eyes. Uh, yeah, we can find things wrong with that, but three through nine, you really can't find anything wrong with them themselves. So, therefore, why does God judge them? Well, it goes back to what Peter was talking about in 1 Peter 3, that the sign of godliness is not what a person wears. Uh, a sign of God is what a person is. And what we have here with Israel is that these things became more important than the things of God. Uh, people more worried about their own looks than they are their testimony. And of course, we see that very much today. I mean, this, this is, uh, uh, seems like an article from the newspaper rather than the Bible as far as uh, current events are concerned, is that people are more worried about the styles they wear and the influence that that has upon other people. Uh, and thinking that, you know, I'm better than you because I have all these things and you don't have them. Uh, therefore, I'm even more godly than you because God has blessed me with material things and apparently he hasn't blessed you with material things. Uh, and that can go, you know, even when you talk about like the Amish people. Uh, they dress like they dress, ironically, because they don't want to stand out in, in public. Uh, they don't want to draw attention to themselves. And so they wear these uh, archaic uh, outfits that end up drawing attention to themselves. Uh, and that's, that's mankind. That's, that's, how, that's how people are. Uh, but your godliness, is, again, is not the things that you put on. Uh, after God judged them, he gave, said instead of sweet fragrance, there would be rottenness. So instead of all the expensive perfumes, and uh, I, I don't even remember what the perfume industry is a year, billions of dollars a year uh, sold in perfume. Uh, and, and perfume in and of itself is fine, but people are more concerned about that and, and keeping up with the current trend of a certain type of perfume. Instead of a sash, there would be rope. Instead of their well-said hair, there would be baldness. Instead of beauty, there would be shame, disgrace, and, and even widowhood. 
it's, this is so far removed from what Peter was talking about in 1 Peter 3, uh, 1 through 4. Uh, let me back up here a minute. I didn't mean to hit that yet. Uh, 1 Peter 3, uh, 1 through 4, 4, he's talking about that the real beauty is the spiritual beauty, the innate beauty that comes from a woman uh, because of her spirituality, uh, her personal testimony not because of the riches that she has and how that those riches take away from the things of God rather than adding to the things of God. And so God judged them for that, for that haughty spirit. Just going back to the first one again, they were haughty with their noses in the air. Remember God said, pride cometh before uh, destruction. Uh, no, no, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, pride cometh before destruction and the Holy Spirit before the fall. That attitude of superiority, uh, God said, would be their downfall. <clears throat> then the seventh indictment is fruitlessness. Fruitlessness. There's two parables given that use Israel as uh, uh, for a symbol, or, or symbols of Israel, let me put it that way. Uh, in the New Testament, Matthew 21, we see the fig tree uh, several times in, in the New Testament. Israel is symbolized as a fig tree. In this case, it's a vineyard. Uh, and so God here uses to represent the nation of Israel and how that the vineyard was planted, but there's no fruit from it. Uh, so break this down a little bit. In chapter 5, we see what God did for, for the vineyard in the first place. So he planted on a very fertile hill with the choicest vines planted. Uh, God did the best that they, more than they deserved. Gave, gave them the best. They were God's chosen people. He plowed it, took out all the rocks. It's a good fertile soil. He built a watchtower. He means he protected it from from outsiders, from the cows grazing or the uh, deer or whatever animals coming in and destroying it. And he cut a wine press in the rocks, so he gave them again everything. Four, he waited patiently for the harvest. So God didn't expect too much out of them in the beginning. He gave them time to grow as a nation. But what did God receive from the vineyard? No, nothing. Wild and sour grapes. They had all the advantages. Remember what Paul said in Romans chapter 3, was there any profit in being a Jew? Uh, and that was a, uh, much of a way, chiefly because they had the oracles of God, they had the word of God. So they had it all. And what did they do? Well, they looked to their own selves. They looked to what they did. Um, Haggai and Zechariah were sent to Israel after the captivity, after the return from the captivity, when Joshua the high priest and Zerubbabel uh, led the children of Israel back into the, the land. And Haggai had to rebuke the people, and he said, Consider your ways. Uh, you need, in other words, think about what you're doing. God sent you back to build the temple, and you've neglected building the temple to build your own houses. And you, you labor, but you bring in little, he said. Uh, and when you bring it home, God blows upon it. He, in other words, all that work you do from sun up to sundown for your own things, then you have very, very little, and then God just blows it away. And you have to start all over the next day. Why? Because you're doing your own things first. You're building your own things and not building the house of God. And so here we have all this labor that God put into Israel and they gave him back nothing because they was only concerned about their own ways, of their own things uh, uh, that they gained in life. And what God would do because of this, because there's a judgment, a judgment for sin. And this judgment for sin, this is the consequences. He would tear down the fences so that all the wild animals would be able to come in 
and uh, go to, to pasture in the vineyard, uh, trampled by the cattle, the sheep, and any other animals. He would not prune it nor hoe it. It would become overgrown with briars and thorns. And he would even command the clouds not to rain on it anymore. So he's just barren. Uh, look at Israel today. You know, when you look at Israel in the Old Testament, when the children of uh, God told the twelve spies to go into the land and to seek out their plan of attack to go into the land, not to see if they could do it, but how they would do it. And they came back with a huge bunch of grapes so big that two men had to carry one bunch of grapes. Uh, a land that flowed with milk and honey. And then you go to Israel today, and it's a land that's pretty much barren. Uh, most people have never owned a lawnmower. There's no need for it. Uh, those who do, it's irrigated well to get the grass to grow. Why? Well, because of God's judgment on it. I mean, during the Middle Ages, the uh, Muslims uh, burned Israel because they couldn't uh, gain it for their possession, so they burned what they could, and it destroyed the land, and now the land is pretty much a desert in, in many, many places. Uh, why? The judgment of God upon them. They're still God's chosen nation, still a nation we should support and pray for, and pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Still a requirement that God requires of us. But when they turned their back on God, they suffered the consequences for it. As a nation, that's true, and as individuals, it's true for us. When we turn our back on God, we have to pay the price. The eighth indictment was drunkenness. Well, we live in a society today where drunkenness is, uh, um, is applauded. I mean, you look at the commercials on TV, you look at our society today, Oh yeah, they talk about drunk drivers and how terrible that is, and then they uh, have all the beer companies sponsor all these events that promote all these things, and it's it just, it's sad. Chapter 5, verse 11 says, Woe to them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, that continue until night, till wine inflame them. Just controlled by the alcohol. Not controlled by the Spirit of God, but controlled by the alcohol and to, to drink in order to forget their problems rather than to go to God and get forgiveness of their sins and their problems and to seek a better life. Instead, they covered up with alcohol and God judged them because of that, led by their own ways rather than the thing, ways of God. Chapter 28, verse 7, But they also have erred through wine, through strong drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. And people do the same same thing. You can go on YouTube and watch people being arrested for drunk driving uh, and saying and doing the most ridiculous things. Things that will come back to haunt them because they're all on police camera now the body cams, and their foolishness is seen to the world. And yet, what do they do? They continue in their ways. Without Jesus Christ as their Savior, they have no hope. And they turn to wine, strong drink. Very sad. The ninth indi indictment, ah, morality. Not immorality, but ah morality. Ah morality means no morals. Look what it says in 520 of Isaiah. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. That is a definite mark of our society today. Somebody goes to church and they're considered evil. They're considered crazy. When the Speaker of the House, I can't remember what his name is now, uh, but when he became Speaker of the House and the media found out that he went to church, they attacked him for that, attacked him for his foolishness and how he is not qualified 
to be a leader in, in Congress because he goes to church. I mean, at one time, it was a requirement for all politicians to go to church in order to be elected in this country. Now, it's looked down upon. And those that do evil are promoted to high positions. Look, look at the, the singers, the actors and actresses in the world that we live in today, and the immoral things that they're doing, and the world calls that good. It's just, it's a disgrace to put darkness for light and light for darkness, but bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. We're living in a day and age where our morality, that there is no right and wrong according to the world, except that if you're doing the things of God, if you're a Christian, then you're, you're wrong. Anything else is right. Any abomination that you want to commit. There are people who are pushing for pedophiles to not be punished because that's just you, you love who you love, they say. And you can't control who you love. I mean, it's an abomination before God. And the world thinks that's logical. Uh, it, it's, we're living in a society today that is just destroying this world. And we're watching it fall before our eyes. It's just, obviously, God's judging this world for that. Not just our country, but the whole world. That's why I'm looking so much forward to the coming of Jesus Christ. I, I just think we're in the last days. I think that sin has become so multiplied out, outwardly. It's always been there. But now outwardly, it's acceptable. And people rejoice over sin. And they sorrow over morality. Tenth indictment is humanism. By humanism, mean put man first. Mankind is first. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. You watch news or whatever it might be on uh, TV, m different media, and they use statements about the earth being billions of years old and uh, saw the, some of they were one of the Hawaiian islands, I forget. They said the oldest Hawaiian island was so many millions of years old. And they gave a, a date for it, and I don't remember what it was. Uh, and they stay, say it, and nobody questions them. Nobody says, how do you know that? They accept it blindly. Uh, and we're living in a world that, that does that. Just accepts things blindly without any thought whatsoever put into it. Eleventh indictment is unscriptural alliances. Which we know the New Testament says, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. But here in the Old Testament, God here is condemning Israel in particular in chapter 31, verse 1, when he said, Woe to them that go down to Egypt for help. So when they got in trouble, who'd they trust? They trusted Egypt. It goes on saying, And stay on horses, and trust in chariots, because there are many, and in horsemen, because they are very strong. But they look not unto the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord. And that's the whole problem. They're trusting the world for help. And that's exactly what we see in this world today. People are trusting the world. They, they believe they deserve handouts from the world. That they don't have to work. They don't have to do anything for it. That the world is supposed to just hand them money and housing and finances, whatever it might be, uh, because they deserve it. Let me tell you something. We don't deserve it. Scripture says, man doesn't work, he doesn't eat. And we've got so many people in this world that feel like they deserve all these different things. And they're committing abominations before God. And they look for the world for help. And even people in our churches look to the world for help. They get in trouble financially, so they get out of church to uh, work a second job. And it's an abomination. They're seeking the world's help and not going to seeking the Holy One of Israel. 
Twelfth Indictment's rebellion. That this is a rebellious people. Lying children. Children that will not hear the law of the Lord. I spread out my hands all day into a rebellious people which walks in a way that was not good after their own thoughts. It says in Isaiah 65, verse 2. Rebellious people. Rebelling against the things of God. And again, we see that in our world today. These indictments, that so far we looked at this as the 12th one, got a couple more, but all these indictments against Israel are true against the United States. Why would we think that we can escape judgment? We think all we have to do is pray and God will deliver this nation? I mean, it says in 2 Chronicles seven fourteen, My people called by my name shall humble themselves and pray, seek my face, that God will deliver. And that is absolutely true. God said that in 2 Chronicles seven fourteen. It is absolutely the Word of God. However, continue in the Bible and get the full picture and go to the book of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah was told to preach to the people to cause them to repent and God would save them. However, it got to a point where God said, they've crossed the line, it's too late. Still preach to them, still get them to repent, but it's too late, they're going into captivity. Where are we at in this world today? Are we at the place where God will allow us to come out of this? Have national revival? Or have we crossed the line to where we're going into captivity? Thirteenth indictment, infant sacrificing. Inflaming yourselves with idols under every green tree, slaying the children in the valley under the clefts of the rocks. Is that going on in our world today? Absolutely. Absolutely. Abortion, euthanasia, I mean, people offering up children as sacrifices. That's going on in this country. Don't fool yourselves thinking that we're above and beyond that because we're not. I mean, how many millions of babies have been sacrificed to the God of convenience? And people promoting it, thinking that it's a, it's a great thing. That's a normal thing. Not only do they think it's a great thing, but they think that the government, which is funded by the people, that everybody else should pay for their abortion and that they don't have to. And that's the world we're living in today, where it's not a matter of abortion now or not. It's about, about the argument is, well, who's going to fund it? And it's an abomination before God. People murdering their own babies and then closing their eyes to it. Because they say, think if they don't see the baby, then it's okay. And it's ridiculous. Fourteenth indictment, just the overall condition of Israel. From the sole of the foot, even into the head. There's no soundness in it. But wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They've not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. And their sin is extremely apparent. Not even covering it up anymore. And that's what our country has gotten to. People are not even trying to be religious anymore. They've given up on that. Now they're just outwardly abomination before God. It's sad. It's a sad world that we live in today. Now I believe we can have revival. I believe God can bless. If God does send us into captivity, it's for a purpose, and that purpose is to purify ourselves. But whatever happens in this country, I don't know what's going to happen uh, the way things are today. No politician's going to get us out of this mess. 
Only God can do it. And we need and must trust Him for that. Next week, you know, let me read this verse here. Uh, it goes on what I was saying. But behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save. Now his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies, your tongue hath muttered perverseness. Their feet run to evil, and they may make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Wasting and destruction are in their path. The way of peace they know not. And there's no judgment in their goings. They have made them crooked paths. Whoever goeth therein shall not know peace. It's a sad, sad world that we live in. But we are all as unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf. Our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. The judgment here upon Israel is paralleled in our society today. We need to pray. Pray for ourselves. Pray for revival. Pray for our country. Pray believing that God can changes, but also understanding that it might be too late for us as a nation. But as individuals, we still can be delivered by God. Remember, God took Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, the goodly young men. He took them into captivity, in the Babylon captivity first, thus sparing their lives. They didn't have to witness the warfare. So maybe God will send us into captivity first as believers to spare us. But God's judgment is sure and just, and it will come on time. We'll continue this next week.